Hi everyone and welcome to the third part on the operational amplifier. We are going to see some more circuits that involve op-amps. But before we proceed, let us go back to the voltage follower that we discussed in the first part. Remember, this circuit outputs a copy of the input and I mentioned that although such a circuit might seem to be useless, it is actually very useful. The reason is that the circuit has a high input impedance and a low output impedance. This means that a voltage follower can be used whenever a high impedance source needs to drive a low impedance load. Let us explain this with two examples. In our first example, we have a potentiometer of 100 kilo ohms that is connected to a 9 volt battery. The potentiometer allows us to adjust the voltage anywhere between 0 and 9 volts. Suppose that we set the knob to the middle point. Then the potentiometer is equivalent to a voltage divider made of two 50 kilo ohms resistors. I'll let you apply Thévenin's theorem to find out that the output voltage is 4.5 volts and the output impedance is 25 kilo ohms. This is a relatively high impedance. Suppose now that we want to apply these 4.5 volts to a load symbolized by this 220 ohm resistor. This resistor and the 25 kilo ohm output impedance of the potentiometer form a new voltage divider. So I'll let you calculate that the voltage on the load is going to drop down to 39.3 millivolts much lower than the intended 4.5 volts. This means that the potentiometer has to be adjusted and we would have to do so each time we use a load with a different impedance. The solution consists in using a voltage follower in order to isolate the high impedance source from the low impedance load. The output of the potentiometer is unaffected when we connect it to the op-amp because the current through the non-inverting input is zero. The output of the op-amp is equal to the output of the potentiometer, no matter what the value of R is. This is true as long as R is much greater than the output impedance of the op-amp, which is typically a few ohms. In this second example, suppose that we want to design a circuit that instantly turns an LED on when we close the switch and which lets its brightness slowly fade out when we open the switch. The idea is to start with this circuit that outputs a voltage that does what we want. Indeed, when we close the switch, the capacitor is being connected in parallel to the battery, so it charges quasi instantly. The battery is also being connected in parallel to the resistor so the output voltage is instantly equal to the battery. When we open the switch, you should recognize that the capacitor and the resistor form an RC circuit. As a result, the capacitor's voltage drops exponentially with a time constant RC of 2.2 seconds. But now, if we connect this circuit to an LED and a 220 ohm resistor, we don't observe the expected behavior. The LED will certainly instantly turn on when we close the switch, but it will also almost instantly turn off when we open it. The reason is that now the capacitor no longer discharges through the one mega ohm resistor. Instead, it discharges through the LED and the 220 ohm resistor, which together have a much lower resistance. The solution, as in the first example, is to insert a voltage follower between the output of the capacitor and the LED. Once again, the op-amp does not deplete the capacitor's charge because the input impedance of its inputs is infinite. I hope that you are now convinced that the voltage follower is useful. Let us now continue our analysis of op-amp circuits with the logarithmic amplifier. As its name suggests, this circuit can output a voltage equal to the logarithm of the input voltage. 
It is useful at this point to remind the Shockley diode equation which expresses the current through the diode as the reverse saturation current IS times the exponential of the voltage applied to the diode divided by the ideality factor N times the thermal voltage VT minus 1. For our purposes, we can make a reasonable approximation by noticing that the thermal voltage VT is about 1 over 40 of a volt. This means that even when we apply a small forward voltage to the diode, the exponential term is much bigger than 1, so we can drop the minus 1 and obtain a simplified equation. With this in mind, we can now solve the circuit. First, we assume that the input voltage is positive since it would make no sense to calculate the logarithm of a negative voltage. With a positive input voltage, the diode is conducting, so the regime is linear and the inverting input is virtually grounded. We can easily express the equality between the current through the resistor and the current through the diode, namely Ohm's law for the left-hand side and the simplified Shockley equation for the right-hand side. We can solve this equation for V out and find that it is equal to a negative constant times the natural logarithm of the input voltage divided by another constant. If this output voltage is not satisfactory for your purposes, we can reshape it. First, thanks to a property of the logarithm, the effect of the constant Ris is only to produce a positive offset of the output. We can cancel it by passing the output voltage through a difference amplifier that subtracts this offset. We can as well get rid of the minus NVT factor by passing the output voltage through an inverting amplifier. The natural next step is to analyze the exponential amplifier. This circuit is very similar to the previous one, only the resistor and the diode have been exchanged. As before, we proceed by writing the equality between the current through the diode and the current through the resistor, which is trivially solved for V out. Thus, the output voltage is a negative constant times the exponential of the input voltage divided by another constant. As before, we can get rid of the minus RIS factor by passing the output through an inverting amplifier. In a similar way, we can pass the input voltage through a non-inverting amplifier in order to get rid of the NVT constant. Would you believe that an op-amp can turn a random diode into a superdiode? Okay, let us first define what a superdiode is. As you know, a diode lets the current go in one direction and not in the other. But when we describe a diode like this, we ignore the fact that a real diode has a threshold voltage, that is to say, a voltage that we need to apply for it to be significantly conducting. Also, when the diode is conducting, its voltage is not really constant. It depends slightly on how much current is flowing, which means that the diode has a resistance. In fact, this resistance decreases as the applied voltage increases. With all this in mind, it becomes natural to think of a superdiode as a diode with no threshold and a zero resistance. The red curve shows the current as a function of voltage of a real diode. We can see that a real diode blocks pretty well reverse currents. Remember, the reverse saturation current IS is of the order of 10 to the minus 14 amps. Then we see that the diode becomes significantly conducting around a voltage of 0.7 volt. Ideally, a superdiode would have a current voltage characteristics represented by the blue curve. The current is zero for negative voltages. On the figure, it is slightly shifted so that we can see the red curve under it. And then the slope suddenly becomes infinite for zero voltage. This means that the superdiode has a zero voltage drop for any current. In other words, 
it has a zero resistance. The circuitron simulates this behavior to a good extent, so let us analyze it. There are two unusual things about this circuit. The first one is that the output of the circuit is not the output of the op-amp, but the inverting input. The resistor RL represents the load to which we want to apply the rectified voltage. The other unusual thing is that the regime of the op-amp depends on the input. It is non-linear if Vn is negative and linear otherwise. The good news is that the analysis is very simple in both cases because we don't need to do any calculation. For this, all we need to notice is that V out cannot be negative. This is because the maximum reverse current in the diode is IS, which once again is of the order of 10 to the minus 14 amps. So the most negative output voltage would be minus RL times IS which is basically zero. Now, if the input voltage is negative, then the regime is nonlinear because the inverting input cannot be negative. So the op-amp outputs a saturated voltage minus Vsat. Thus, the diode is reverse polarized and the output is grounded via the load resistor. Since no current can flow, Vat equals zero. If the input voltage is positive, then the op-amp is going to increase its output voltage until the diode lets enough current flow through the resistor to raise the inverting input's voltage to the same value as the non-inverting input voltage. So the regime is linear and V out equals V in. As a result, we have shown that this circuit behaves as a superdiode. Ideally, a superdiode would completely block the current when it is reverse polarized. Real diodes actually do this quite well, as their maximum reverse current is of the order of 10 to the minus 14 amps. Now, we could use this superdiode as a half wave rectifier, but it would work only if the frequency of the input signal is low. The reason is that the op-amp used in the superdiode saturates when the input signal is negative, and when the signal becomes positive, it takes some time for the op-amp to get out of the saturated state. So, if the frequency of the input signal is too high, the output signal will be deformed. So, instead of a superdiode, we use this circuit because this one doesn't saturate whether the input signal is positive or negative. First, we note that the inverting input is virtually grounded. If V in is positive, then the current through R1 can go only through the diode D1. It cannot go through R2 because the second diode D2 is reverse polarized. Since there is no current through R2, there is no voltage drop across it, so V out equals zero. If V in is negative, then the current through R1 can come only from R2. The equality between the current through R1 and R2 implies that V out equals minus R2 over R1 times V in. So if we choose R2 to be the same as R1, then the negative half cycle is rectified. If instead you prefer to let the positive cycle go through the output and block the negative cycle, all you have to do is to pass the input signal through an inverting amplifier prior to passing it through the half-wave rectifier. Now, very often we are interested in a full-wave rectifier, and this is achieved by this circuit. Here we can easily check that both op-amps work in the linear regime. This implies that the inverting input of the first op-amp is virtually grounded and Vc equals Vb. If V in is positive, then the current through R1 cannot go through R3 because D2 is reverse polarized and the current through the inputs of the second op-amps are zero. So it has to go through R2. 
This implies that V in over R1 equals minus V A over R2. And also that V B, which is equal to V C, is zero since no current flows through R3. Using the equality between the current through R4 and R5 leads to V A over R4 equals minus V at over R5. So we can conclude that for a positive input signal, the output signal is equal to the input signal multiplied by R2, R5, divided by R1, R4. Now, if Vn is negative, then D1 is blocked and D2 is conducting, and the current through R1 can come from both R2 and R3. So this case is slightly more complicated. Writing the equality between the current through R1 and those through R2 and R3 allows us to write that V in over R1 equals minus V A over R2 minus V C over R3. Noting that R2 and R4 form a voltage divider, we can express V A as a function of V B. If we substitute this expression in the previous equation, and use the fact that Vc equals Vb, then we find that V in over R1 equals the negative of 1 over R2 plus R4 plus 1 over R3 times Vb. So we can solve for Vb and express it as a function of Vn. For the next step, we can see that R2 plus R4 and R5 form a voltage divider. So VB can easily be expressed as a function of V out. Finally, the two expressions found for VB must be equal. So we conclude that V out equals minus R3 over R1 times V in. We can now put everything together. We found the expressions for the output voltage for both positive and negative input signals and we can clearly see that we get what we want if we choose all resistors to be equal. Namely, V out is the absolute value of V in. So the full wave is rectified. That's enough for this third part, but we still have many open circuits to discuss. So I hope to see you in the next part.